thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mikaela Vrazdova and I'm a senior associate at Scott Legal PC. Today we are going to spend some time and talk about how to obtain a green card uh, based on employment and we will go over um, the different employment green card categories, but this webinar will be focused on getting a green card um, through the PERM process. So a few things before we get started. So Scott Legal is a full service immigration law firm and we assist individuals pursuing various types of visas and green cards, um, anything from family-based, employment-based, um, green cards and visas. We regularly process a high number of employment-based green cards. Uh, we will continue to have this webinar series and we will have at least um, two webinars a month on different um, immigration topics. Um, at the end of this webinar, uh, we will send you out a few things. So we will send you the PowerPoint um, we will be using today. Um, we will send you a comprehensive um, visa guide um, that will go over the PERM process. And we will also send you a link where you can sign up for additional webinars um, we will have in the future. And also a link um, where this webinar will be recorded. Um, finally, we will send you um, a link for our YouTube channel and we encourage you to subscribe um, to our YouTube channel and hit the notification button as we often post uh, new uh, videos on different immigration topics. Um, and finally, we'll send you a link where you can set up a consultation with one of our um, attorneys um, to discuss your particular case. So um, regarding speakers, um, so today we are lucky to have Kelly Legrand Wiener, um, who is the managing attorney of the firm and who has a vast experience processing uh, perm green cards. Um, and as I mentioned, my name is Mikaela Vrazdova and I will be the moderator of today's webinar. Um, finally, for any question you, know, you may have as we, as we talk about the perm green cards, uh, please feel free to put it in the in the chat box or in the Q and A box, and we will get to all questions um, either as we as we speak or at the end of the presentation. So I will leave it to Kelly um, to start the webinar. Thank you, Michaela. Perfect. So um, we'll you know we'll kind of just briefly go over as Michaela mentioned. This webinar will focus largely on the perm process, um, the labor certification process, uh, but we also just wanted to kind of briefly discuss um, some of the other employment-based green card categories. Uh, so we have the EB1A. Um, you know, this is an extraordinary ability green card for people who have. Um, risen to the very top of their field in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics uh, through a showing of sustained national or international acclaim. Um, so, you know, these are for people, perhaps they have a kind of one-time achievement like a Pulitzer Prize or an Oscar, an Olympic medal, um, or if not, um, they can also show this uh, extraordinary ability through showing they meet three of, um, you know, various criteria. Uh, so that's kind of one potential um, option. And we do have a webinar that focuses um, on extraordinary ability, uh, green cards and visas. So I'd encourage you to, to watch that if you're interested in that category. Um, there's also the EB1B, which is for outstanding researchers and professors, uh, the EB1C, which is for multinational managers or executives. Um, so people being transferred um, you know, from abroad to work in the US, often they're on an L1 visa first and then transferred to the EB1C. Under the EB2, uh, you know, you have to have either an advanced degree or exceptional ability to qualify under this category. Um, this can either be um, for people applying for the national interest waiver. Uh, so this is for people that are asking for the government to waive the PERM labor certification process um, and allow them to self-petition for a green card or to petition under an employer, but not have to go through the labor certification process. Um, in order to get the national interest waiver, you need to show that there's an endeavor of substantial merit and national importance, that the applicant is um, well positioned to advance the endeavor, and that on balance, it's beneficial to the U.S. to waive the requirements of the, the labor certification and the job offer. Um, we also have webinars that specifically focus on the national interest waiver. So again, if you're interested in that, I, I encourage you to check out um, those specific webinars. Um, another way you can get an EB2 green card is through the PERM process, which we'll discuss in more detail on the next slide. 
um, under the EB3, this can be, um, you know, you can get this green card through the perm process. And this is for professionals, meaning uh, people in jobs that require uh, at least a bachelor's degree. There's also skilled workers. So two years of training or, or experience or more and unskilled workers. So jobs that require under two years of training or experience. Um, there's also an EB-4. Um, so this is a, a kind of a special immigrant visa. There's many different kind of green card um, categories under this one. We won't discuss this in, in detail. Um, and then there's the EB-5. Uh, you know, again, we have webinars that are specific to the EB-5 that go over all the requirements. Um, generally for an EB-5, you know, you need to make an investment. Um, so an investment of either 800,000 or a million 50,000. Um, and you have to create 10 full-time jobs. There's many more specific requirements regarding the EB-5. Um, you know, but can be a good option if, um, you know, investment is the route you would like to take to get a green card. And again, we have webinars specifically on that topic that I would encourage you to check out. So let's talk a little bit about the labor certification process and what is PERM. So PERM refers to the process where a company sponsors an applicant for a green card. Um, so this can be sponsored under the EB-2 or the EB-3. Um, and it, it's done by a US employer. There has to be, there are some green card categories where you are allowed to self petition, but under the PERM, you have to have a US employer that is driving the, um, the process of sponsoring you for the green card. And the PERM is really a three step process. Uh, so, you know, first there is the PERM, which is kind of, I'd say, the longest part of the process. Um, then there's the I 140, and then there's the I 485, which is the actual green card application. So, you have to get through those first two steps before you get to that green card at the, the third stage. Um, so, in terms of the PERM, you know, what does it entail? So you will, um, you know, the employer will work with the attorney to draft a PERM compliant job description. Uh, this is often different than a normal job description where, um, you know, perhaps you would include all of the kind of, um, you know, ideal criteria, right? You know, great communicator, team player, um, you know, for the PERM, what's required is the employer has to provide a job description that includes the minimum requirements to do the job in a reasonable manner. Um, and the reason for this is that they want the job when it, um, you know, is, is tested on the labor market to be as open as possible to U.S. workers. Uh, so once the job description is drafted, then you can do, um, you know, you file for a prevailing wage determination. Uh, the prevailing wage is the wage that the company will have to pay to the employee after the green card is granted. And the company needs to demonstrate they have the ability to pay that wage, um, generally through showing their financial statements, their tax returns. Um, you know, sometimes alternate evidence can also be uh, can be considered. Um, so once you have that prevailing wage, then the company is going to actually undergo the recruitment process. Uh, so this is, you know, the labor market test. And this is where the company must actually place advertisements. And there's very specific requirements in the regulations about what type of advertisements need to be placed and how long they need to be placed for. Um, generally, the recruitment process is going to take at least 60 days, um, could take a little bit longer but always has to take at least at least 60 days. Um, you're, you know, kind of running your ads mostly during that first 30 day period. And then there's a second 30 day period where the ads may not be running or maybe one ad is running. Um, and, but the company still has to accept all of the um, applicants. Uh, so during this time, the, the company would be reviewing resumes, um, you know, interviewing any applicants that appear that they may be qualified. And if at the end of the process, the company determines that there are no willing, qualified, and available U.S. workers for the position, then the company can proceed with filing the labor certification. So if during the process, the company does find a qualified U.S. worker who is willing and available to take that position, the company doesn't have to hire that person, of course, but the PERM process would have to stop because the purpose of this process is that in order for the company to sponsor this employee, they need to show that there are no U.S. workers that could take this job. There are no minimally qualified, um, you know, willing, qualified, and available U.S. workers for this job. So if the company does find someone during the process, the process would need to stop, and the company could then perhaps retest the labor market in the future. Um, however, if the company makes it through the recruitment period, um, you know, they've evaluated the resumes, there is nobody that is willing, qualified, and available to take this job, then the company can proceed with filing the labor certification. Uh, so then you file the labor certification with the Department of Labor, and the, de labor cert um, the Department of Labor can either certify uh, the labor certification, or they can deny it, or they can audit it. 
Um, and so, you know, when they audit it, what that means is they're asking for all of the proof, um, you know, that the company actually conducted the labor market test. They often want to see the actual resumes. They want to see the evaluation sheets. Um, sometimes they're auditing for a specific reason. For example, if the company has a foreign language requirement, or the company has requirements for the job that are outside what's normally required for that occupation. Uh, you know, let's say that for a landscape um, architect, you know, norm, it's normal to require, you know, two years of experience, and this company requires nine years of experience. Sometimes things like that, um, you know, can, can increase the likelihood of an audit, and then the company would need to provide documentation showing why it was a necessity, uh, you know, to require this extra, um, you know, this extra experience over what's normally required. Um, you know, in terms of kind of timing of the perm, this is really always a moving target. Um, so, you know, the per because you're dealing with different agencies and different um, departments within the agencies. So for example, for the prevailing wage, um, you know, right now these are taking anywhere from six months to 12 months to come back. So it's a really wide range um, and is also taking quite a long time. Um, and because it's always, you know, generally it's preferable to get the prevailing wage before you move ahead with the recruitment, um, this is really delaying things, you know, delaying the process. Um, you know, so once you get the prevailing wage and you're doing recruitment, recruitment, as I said, will take probably at least 60 days, um, you know, could be a little bit longer, depending on the timing of placing the ads. Um, and then once you file the labor certification with the Department of Labor, that's taking right now around eight to nine months. So all of these timeframes that I'm listing right now, you know, these can change over time. They do change over time, um, you know, depending on the Department of Labor workload and, um, you know, just how fast they're getting through these, these cases. So always a good idea to kind of check with your attorney, um, you know, understand, you know, your what's going on with your underlying status to make sure you're planning far enough ad in advance, um, you know, to get the approval. So if the labor certification is certified, um, at that time, then the company can go ahead and file the I-140 petition. Um, so this is a uh, you know, petition filed with US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And in this petition, the company will need to show that they have the ability to pay the prevailing wage and that they had that ability since the time they filed the PERM. So tax returns, audited financial statements, if the company is very large and has over 100 employees, sometimes the government will accept a letter from the financial officer of the company, um, you know, stating that they have the ability to pay the prevailing wage. Um, in the I-140, you're also going to include the proof that the applicant meets all the requirements for the PERM job. So let's say that the PERM job, you know, required a bachelor's degree and two years of experience as an engineer. Um, you know, so the, the, at that point, the applicant would need to provide proof of their degree that they have that bachelor's degree or foreign equivalent. And employer experience letter is documenting that they have that required two years of experience as an engineer. Um, the I-140 petition um, can actually be premium processed, so you can pay an additional fee to the government to get a response within 15 calendar days. Um, and then if either um, if an immigrant visa is currently available and the person is already in the United States in valid status, uh, you can file the I-485 application. Uh, you have the option to potentially file this concurrently with the I-140, um, or uh, you can also wait for the I-140 to be approved and file the I-485 green card application afterwards. Um, so what we have here in terms of the timing being current or not, you know, so sometimes um, Sometimes there's a backlog in availability of immigrant visas uh, for um, people who are born in China or India. Unfortunately, there's a very long backlog. Um, so if you, um, you know, get to this stage, you have an I-140 approved, but there's no immigrant visa available to you, then unfortunately you can't file the I-485 until your category becomes current. Um, so it's important to watch the visa bulletin to understand, you know, is there any um, delay in, in immigrant visa availability? For example, right now there, there are some delays in the EB-2 category and the EB-3 category. Um, so always a good thing to talk to your attorney about so you're planning appropriately. Also, once you get to the I-485 stage, you can, at this point, um, your family members can also apply uh, for green cards using Form I-485 if they're in the United States um, in valid status. And uh, this is your spouse and any unmarried um, children under uh, 21. All right, so let's talk about kind of the two options for the actual green card process. So if you've made it through, um, you know, the PERM, you have kind of two options available to you. So one is an adjustment of status and the other is consular processing. Um, adjustment of status 
is generally going to be used, like let's say somebody is here working on an H-1B, um, you know, and, and they live here, their spouse lives here, their children go to school here. Um, usually you're going to file an adjustment of status. That's that's generally going to be the, the best bet since you're living in the United States. Um, you know, the, the benefit of filing the adjustment of status is it gives you the ability to remain in the United States. So it may be preferable to continue, um, you know, renewing your, your H-1B so you have underlying status. But let's say for some reason you couldn't or didn't want to and your, your underlying status lapsed, you're still permitted to stay in the U.S. based on this pending adjustment of status. Um, you also are able to file for work and travel authorization and your spouse and children are also able to file for work and travel authorization, uh, you know, based on, um, you know, the, the pending green card application. Uh, towards the end of the process, you know, often they will call you in for an interview, um, you know, to confirm the details of the job, um, you know, and, and also just discuss any, you know, anything on your I-485 applications to make sure there's no inadmissibility issues. And then if it's approved, you will receive your green cards. So let's talk about consular processing. Um, in, in consular processing, this could be appropriate, let's say that, you um, you know, you, you're not in the United States or you were in the U United States working for a company and then that, and then, you know, the company transferred you abroad for a few years, but you still plan to return and they continued the green card process. Um, you know, in that case, because you don't live in the U.S., you you aren't um, you don't have any status in the U.S., consular processing is the option that you would choose for your, you know, green card process. Some people may also choose consular processing, um, you know, perhaps they're not on an H-1B. So the H-1B and the L give you kind of special benefits uh, when you file a green card application, um, you know, where you can continue to, you know, travel without having to wait for travel authorization. But let's say, for example, that you were on an E-2 visa and a company was sponsoring you. Once the I-485 is filed, you wouldn't be able to travel internationally um, until you got your advanced parole travel authorization. And those applications are taking quite a long time, up to you know, up to a year, even a little bit more. So if you're somebody who needs to travel constantly, um, you know, and your your underlying visa wouldn't allow you to do that with an I-485 pending, then you would often go consular processing. And so what, what happened then is after your I-140 is approved, this approval would be sent to the National Visa Center. Um, they would contact you um, and ask you to pay, you know, pay the immigrant visa fee to fill out a DS-260 application, which is kind of lots of biographical information about you, um, and also submit supporting documents to the National Visa Center. Um, so these are very similar to the documents you would submit for your I-485 application. Um, so the National Visa Center would then review the documents and send the file to the U.S. consulate where you, you know, in the country where you live, or if you're living in the U.S., the country you previously resided in before you moved to the U.S., um, you know, and then the consulate will eventually call you for an interview. Um, they will give you an immigrant visa stamp in your passport. You'll enter the United States, and then within a couple months, your green card would be mailed to you. So let's talk a little bit about who can pay for green card fees. I think this comes up quite a lot. Uh, you know, there are situations perhaps where people are, um, you know, um, you know, wanting to get a green card and a company perhaps is willing to sponsor them but doesn't want to pay the fees. Uh, so um, unfortunately, those types of situations really do not work. Um, the fees related to the perm process, both the legal fees, you know, fees, um, you know, to place the advertisements, things like that, all must be paid by the sponsoring employer. So it's, it's not permitted that the applicant, um, you know, will will pay for these fees. Um, when you get to the, the I-140 petition and the green card petition, those fees may be paid by the employer or employee. So there is an ability kind of in the later parts of the application to, um, you know, perhaps have an agreement um, with your employer. But for the PERM, um, it's not permitted that the applicant pay. So let's talk a little bit about dual intent and which visas have dual intent. Um, so, you know, many immigrant visas do not allow for dual intent, um, meaning, you know, applicants have to show they do not intend to move to the U.S. permanently. So, for example, if you're getting an F-1 student visa um, or you're getting a TN visa, you know, there's a standard that says you have to show you have a residence abroad that you do not intend to abandon. Um, you intend to move, you know, back, uh, you know, to your home country. There are some visas uh, where they allow for dual intent, which basically means you can have this temporary visa and it's also okay that you have the intent to move to the U.S. permanently. So the specific dual intent visas are the H-1B and the L, where there is specific regulatory language that states that it's okay that, um, that you're on H-1B or you're on L and um, you, intent, you, know, you have a green card petition pending. Um, the O is on here as well, just because there's some kind of there's some favorable language 
Um, we almost will call this a quasi dual intent visa. Um, there's some favorable language that states that just having an immigrant petition pending doesn't mean, uh, you know, that you cannot, um, you know, still be eligible to get an O visa. Um, but the language is not as clear as with the H-1B or the L. So for the O visa, the E visa is another one like this, where there's kind of a lower standard for proving non-immigrant intent, but it's not a full dual intent visa the way we consider for H-1B or L. So let's talk about some considerations when moving from um, a visa to a green card. Um, so you always want to think about timing and underlying visa status, how much time is left on your current visa. Um, so, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, some visas are harder to extend or perhaps impossible to extend. Um, you know, once your your I-140 or your green card petition is filed. Um, so, for example, with the, you know, with the TN visa, you know, once your green card petition is filed, you're really not going to be able to, um, you know, extend your your TN, your TN visa. Um, you know, you wouldn't be able to travel outside the U.S. because that would abandon your adjustment of status application, um, you know, or if you have if you have shown you have the intent to have a green card, you know, you may not be able to be granted the TN anyway because you don't meet the non-immigrant intent, um, you know, criteria. Um, so it's always important to just think about, you know, what visa am I on? You know, what is permitted under this visa? And at each stage of the filing, so when you're filing the PERM, really nothing has been filed, you know, in the employee's name. Um, but once you get to the I-140, and then especially when you get to the green card application, you know, at each stage, you should, you know, discuss with your immigration attorney regarding what is your underlying status, how much time is left, and take into consideration, you know, should you renew before that filing um, to avoid any issues with non-immigrant intent. Um, also, you want to consider, do you want to adjust status, or do you want to get your green card through consular processing? You know, so again, if you're living in the U.S. full-time and, you, you know, your priority is to be able to stay in the U.S. and work, probably adjusting status is, is the right, you know, the right path. Um, if you're someone that needs to travel frequently and you're not on H or L, uh, you know, consular processing may, may be a better option um, because, you know, you would have to otherwise wait for travel authorization, which could take several months. Um, you also want to consider your children. Um, you know, you know, do you like, do you want to start the green card process earlier because you want to avoid issues with them aging out? Um, you know, your children will age out of eligibility to be dependents at 21. Um, so, you know, if you're just starting your green card process when your child is 20, you know, that could be an issue uh, given how long it's taking to actually get the green card. So uh, for many people, they will have an interview at the end of the process. Um, so it's, it's you know, this is not just a formality. It is an important part of the process and you want to prepare for it. Um, so prior to, you know, any of your, your interviews, you want to review your immigrant visa petition. So your I-140 petition, you know, the labor certification, if your employer has provided that to you, um, you want to review your, you know, any forms that you filed, um, you know, and, and kind of the information on those forms. Um, you want to organize and print the documents documents to bring with you to the interview. Um, often the interview notice will tell you exactly what they want you to bring. Um, usually it's good to bring uh, the originals and then also bring a copy in case they want to keep it. Um, you know, if you're filing an I-485, uh, then you'll need to do an I-693 medical exam. Uh, so you want to make sure that's not expired. Um, you want to get updated proof of employment from your employer. So, you know, an employer letter, um, you know, proof of your current pay stubs. Um, if you're adjusting status in the US, you also need to show you've been maintaining your status. Um, so, you know, pay stubs in the employer letter should confirm that. And you also want to meet with your attorney and do a practice interview. Um, you know, during these uh, types of interviews, it's very normal that you would get, uh, you know, get nervous. So it's a good idea sometimes to just practice, uh, you know, with an attorney answering some of these more standard questions. So you feel a little bit more prepared going into the interview. So what is porting um, and can you change employers during the green card process? I'd say this is a very, very common question that people have. Um, and unfortunately, really porting only comes into play towards the end of the green card process. So porting in this context allows employees to change employers once the I-485 has been pending for at least 180 days. Um, and the I-140 connected to that I-485 must be you know, approved as well before you can, you can port. Um, the benefit of being able to port is that your new employer does not have to complete a new PERM or an I-140 for you. So this is, I'd say that, let's say that you're going through the PERM process and your employer has just started testing the labor market and now you are on an H-1B and you transfer to a new 
to a new employer. At that point, you you really retain no benefit from the fact that your previous employer was doing a perm for you. Your new employer, if they wanted to do a perm, would have to just start the process completely from scratch. However, if you've reached this point where your I-485 is pending for 180 days, now your new employer does not need to complete a new perm or a new I-140. What they do need to do is you would submit what's called the I-485 Supplement J, and they would need to show in that form that your new job is in the same or a similar occupational classification as the job that was offered to you on the I-140 that was approved. Um, so you can't kind of port to a brand new position. Uh, you know, it, there needs to be some tie-in to show that it's same or a similar occupational classification. And for this, they'll look at things like job titles, you know, job description, you know, salaries, you know, what's the occupational code and classification. Um, so any evidence that you have to show that it should be, um, you know, considered, you know, in the same or most of the time a similar occupational classification uh, should be submitted. And something to also consider is that porting can work with the same employer. So let's say you're with you know, your same employer, but they want to promote you to a job in a similar occupational classification, but not the same um, as what was on the perm. So you can also port with that, with that same employer. Can you change employers after your green card? Another very, very common question. Um, you know, sometimes people are really tied to an employer for a long time because, you know, that's that's what they need for their visa. Uh, and so they want to know, you know, when am I free to kind of choose where to work without considering any of the, you know, any immigration issues. So when you obtain your green card, you know, through this process, you are making an attestation in good faith that you plan to work for this employer. So that's to say that, um, it's not a good idea to get your green card and then quit your job the next day. Uh, you know, your green card will not be, you know, necessarily immediately revoked or anything like that. Um, you know, but it it does kind of it could come up. Um, you know, so for example, during the naturalization process, uh, you know, generally they will look at what was the basis of getting your green card and they'll look at your employment history. And if there is a showing that you, um, you know, quit immediately, they would likely inquire as to why. Um, it may be that there are, you know, good reasons, you know, perhaps a spouse needed to, you know, got a job transfer or, you know, perhaps, you know, if you were laid off, something like that, it, it's possible it could be explained. Um, but the idea is that you would want to keep working for that employer that sponsored you for the green card for a reasonable amount of time, um, because you are making that good faith attestation that you do plan to continue working for them. So you should only make that attestation if that is actually your plan. Um, and then if it turned out that you needed to leave your employer and work somewhere else, that would be permitted. Um, but you should just be prepared to explain, you know, what were the circumstances of that um, to make sure that there's no kind of um, issue that would cause them to revoke your green card in the future on the feeling that you were, you know, engaging in fraud or a misrepresentation of some kind. All right. So I think we have reached the um, end of the presentation. I, I don't think we have any questions that came in. Um, so I will, uh, I will end the program here. Uh, thank you, uh, Michaela, for joining us. And I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you, Kelly.